Association. And so uh, we have multiple of these town hall events uh, scheduled for around the district, and she is still uh, welcome to come to any of those. Um, I will take the opportunity this evening uh, to speak to you about why, why, who I am, first off, uh, why I'm running, and what I hope to accomplish uh, if successful in November. And then that'll be, that'll be the short part of the ceremony, and then we'll just open it up for questions and we can have a conversation about what public safety looks like now, what we need it to look like in the future, and what the path for Oklahoma looks like, and how I think that we, um, as a two-county district, can kind of be a beacon of hope and maybe an example in that state. So, uh, that being said, my name's Corey Williams. I've been an attorney for a dozen years now, uh, sworn in September 26th, uh, 2006. I only remember that date for a couple of reasons. It was Shannon's birthday, and it just also happens to be the day I was sworn in the bar, which is like having a black cloud lifted uh, off of over me. Any, any attorneys that have sat for the bar know that to be true. Um, I, we moved to Stillwater, and I hung my own shingle. I've done uh, criminal defense work. I've done family law. Uh, I've done real estate uh, for that 12 years. For the last 10 years, I've been the state representative for Stillwater. Uh, it's, we had a, an election in 8 and 10, and then I've been fortunate, and either, either through apathy or through pride, that I haven't had uh, an election for the last eight years. Um, during my time in the legislature, I primarily focused on criminal justice reform uh, and reforming some of our alcohol laws. Uh, I always felt like Stillwater, being an education community, was already well served because at the time I served with President Halligan, former uh, president of OSU and, and chair of the Education Committee in the Senate. Uh, and then uh, Lee Denny, who was chair of the Education Committee uh, in the House, uh, and Dennis Casey, a former superintendent uh, over at Morrison and Cushing, I felt like the last thing still would have really needed was another education representative. So mine, and one of the reasons that I ran in 2008, was on criminal justice reform. Um, we have a system that I believe is predicated upon having more and more and more participants in that system in order to function which has led us to be the number one incarcerator in the United States. And by extension, the United States incarcerates more people than anywhere in the free world. And in Oklahoma, we have the dubious honor of incarcerating more females in Thailand, that bastion of civil rights. And so um, I refuse to believe that our population is worse than Arkansas, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, or any of our surrounding states. But we far and away incarcerate at a rate that would tell you that. And what we don't do is have public safety numbers to reflect our incarceration rate. You would think if we're the number one incarcerator that we would be the safest state in the nation. We are not even close. And in fact, our crime rates are escalating. And it's one of, one of the reasons is we just continue to tear apart the fabric of our communities by incarcerating more and more and more. And we can kind of delve into that in a little while. Um, I, like I said, I've served in the legislature for 10 years during that time. 2012 or 2013, we rewrote the expungement statutes for the first time in since the 80s. And for those who don't know what an expungement is, if you've been convicted of a crime, and if you've pled guilty to a crime, you have a criminal record. You have an arrest record and you have a conviction record. And an expungement is a mechanism in statute that allows that record to be wiped clean so that you can start over if you meet certain requirements enough time has passed, you haven't been charged with another crime, and the crime doesn't fit into a certain category that can never be expunged. And so we rewrote those to broaden them while at the same time protecting public safety. And I can say that statement because I did it in conjunction at that time with the District Attorney's Council and was actually awarded an award from the DAC from being willing to not only open it up and make it better for everyone, but also listen to law enforcement and do it in a controlled manner. Uh, we have since even broadened the expungement statutes even more because it was such a success and nothing bad happened because of it. The sky did not fall down. Uh, and then we've started to tinker around the edges of criminal justice reform uh, back in really 16, 17, a little bit this year. Uh, also did a um, sentencing reform for uh, trafficking. Now drug trafficking sounds like a verb. Sounds like you're selling meth out of the back of your car. It's actually a possession of a volume, of a quantum of a drug. If your third felony, it doesn't matter what your first two were, but if your third felony was trafficking, your only option was life without parole. That's 40 years that you're in for. 
And two things were happening. First off, we were incarcerating a lot of people for a very long time, some of them uh, on a very small amount of drug. And it doesn't take much math or, or, or um, Frank or some of the others to actually hit the trafficking uh, quantum. But the other thing we were having is we were having juries that would not convict because they thought the punishment didn't fit the crime. And so you had frustrated prosecutors coming in and saying, we've got the facts on our side. We know they did it. There's no way that they should be walking because this jury has tossed it out and refuses to give them a guilty conviction and send them in for 40 years. And so, again, worked with prosecutors, kind of. Uh, they were very reluctant on it, but we were able to get it done anyway. And I'm actually very proud to say that as of this day, Governor Fallon has used that small change in the statute. And I say small, it was the largest criminal justice reform that we had done in a very long time. And it was really no small measure, but it did change one little sentence in the statute. She's commuted 37 sentences. Not a single one of them has gone back to prison. Not a single one of them has reoffended. That's 37 lives that have been changed because of that. And it's 37 times about $22,000 a year that the taxpayers have saved by not warehousing that individual. Even more than that, if that individual is over 50 and we're having to put them on our medical rolls. Uh, then we'll get into the graying of our prison population. But if you've ever spent any time uh, in one of our prisons, you know that uh, we have an exceedingly older prison population that is costing us a whole lot of money in medical expenses. Um, okay, so those are the things that I've done while I've been in there. Um, also, uh, the alcohol reform measure that takes effect in just a few days uh, was something that I helped pin uh, in conjunction with the entrepreneurs at Iron Monk, uh, changing it to where we could have and brewers that can distribute their product on site in tap rooms and that was something that I worked on and uh, in the near future on 235 and probably in a theater coming near you um, if you want to be able to get a glass of wine and watch a movie that was also me so if you don't like any of those things you can also blame me for it <laughs> that sword cuts both ways and I'm, I'm well aware of it um, the last probably 24 months uh, everybody's aware that my Life has been sucked up primarily with the budget and the fact that we have been kicking the can down the road for years and years and playing shell games with the money, and then we finally had to answer for those sins uh, in this last year. And so we've had the teacher walkout, which was great. Uh, you talk about raising the level of civil engagement, civil dialogue, that was it. And that's really what these forums are about. I want to have a conversation and I want to raise the level of dialogue because across this country and certainly across this state for years, uh, DAs have run unopposed. And a lot of people aren't even aware uh, that the DA is an elected position. And beyond that, aren't really aware of what the role is. They're the prosecutor. But what does that really, really mean? Uh, the power of the DA is amazing. It, it really is. The power to change a community, the best in that one little office, uh, is, is really quite impressive. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. See, the DA, the police go out and investigate the crime. They make the arrest, or they at least serve the affidavit to the court or to the DA. And the DA decides whether or not we're going to press charges. Was this actually a crime that was committed? Is it a violation of public safety? Do we need to file this charge? And then they also decide what charges are going to be filed out of this incident. Now, you can file one charge, or you can file a whole litany of charges. And there's a whole theoretical discussion about why you shouldn't be filing all of the charges. It's called stacking. And if you stack charges, uh, you have a, a tendency, the result happens to be that most of the people can't afford defense counsel. They could have had, they afforded defense counsel on one charge. Whenever you add five charges to it, the defense attorney looks at it and goes, well, that went from being a $2,000 case to a $10,000 case. Well, unless you have the $10,000 to pay the defense attorney, you're going to either be sitting in jail or you're going to be requesting a public defender or a combination thereof. A lot of jurisdictions have actually started looking at stacking and started to eliminate stacking in an effort to reduce the prison population and basically look at the prosecutors and say, make the case you need to make. You know, I spoke with a law enforcement agent the other day 
and he used a phrase that um, I think would very much resemble the thing that I've been driving at the entire time. You, have, you want to do things because you have to, not because you can. So this person runs a law enforcement agency. He tells his guys, listen, whenever it comes to you interacting with the public out in the field, do things that you have to do. Don't do things that you can do. If you need to arrest somebody, if you have to arrest somebody, well then arrest them. If you have to draw your weapon, then you have to draw your weapon. Don't do those things because you can. And one of the things that I believe is wrong with a lot of what we do in, in Oklahoma, throughout the state, but especially in Payne and Logan counties, is we use the office because we can. We are the state of Oklahoma. We have all the resources on our side, and we're the biggest bully in the room. We file the five charges, not because we have to, but because we can. We put you on a 10-year deferred sentence, not because we have to to protect public safety, but because we can. I want to eliminate that. I want to do things because we have to. The number one job of a DA, you have two, and they're very equal. The official title is the Chief Public Safety Officer of that jurisdiction. The unofficial title should be the person who decides who gets a second chance. Now, I've been accused of being soft on crime and everybody, I'm just going to open up the jailhouse and let everybody out. That's not it at all. You commit a misdemeanor in my jurisdiction, you're going to learn your lesson, but you're going to get a second chance. You commit a felony, well, we're going to bring the hammer down on you. I have a six-year-old and a 12-year-old. I don't want to see our public safety numbers go the other direction. I tell people all the time, why would I take a job where I could actually jeopardize my kids if I do it wrong? I have no interest in that at all. But the tools of the DA's office are fast. Every DA's office is supposed to have a policy of deferred prosecution. Whereas that means, I see that you've committed this crime, and before I charge you, I'm going to look at it, look at the facts of the case, look at your priors, and decide whether or not I need to file this charge, or whether or not I need to enter into a contract with you. And you go do these things. You go do this class. You go do this counseling. You go to this community uh, volunteer project. Whatever it might be. And if you do these things, and you don't get rearrested in a period, I'm never going to file the charge. We're going to make you go away. And I've kept your life on track. Apparently, in Payne and Logan counties, our policy towards that is we don't do it. Because I've been doing it for 12 years, and I've never been able to get that for any one of my clients. In a jurisdiction that has two college campuses, that may not be the best policy. Uh, I am a walking redemption story. For those of you that were here in 2008, I'm not going to rehash it, but you know, it was a good time. <laughs> he says very sarcastically. <laughs> oh, that was a lot of fun. Man. But I am. I'm a walking redemption story. But for somebody taking uh, pity and grace on me, so go I. And, I. and I go back to the trailer park from whence I came. And so there is nothing wrong with looking at people, treating them as a human, and saying, okay, I see that you've done this crime against society. You have violated our norms. You've violated our mores, And you have a penalty to pay. And we are going to hold you accountable. But I'm not going to derail your life. I can't tell you how many times I've had a criminal defendant. Now, this is on possession. Uh, but if it was for a while, it's changed now, thanks to the voters. But possession of marijuana, if it was your second time, it was called possession second subsequent. And it was filed as a felony. So I've got a kid that has a four point in aerospace engineering. NASA's knocking on his door, and Boeing's knocking on his door. He's a junior. Second time, caught with marijuana. I had to beg, plead, barter, and steal to get him a deferred sentence. It was a five-year deferred sentence. Now, in eight months, he was going to be graduating Oklahoma State University and going on and being a really productive member of society and maybe working for DARPA or somewhere else that's going to change the world as we know it. I couldn't get him off that deferred. So all of those people passed on him. Now that crime is something that the voters have now decided should always be a misdemeanor. But at that time, 
over multiple meetings in the district attorney's office. And so, you know what the response was? He should have thought about that before he did it. Now, I know what I was thinking about when I was 18 to 22 year old. And my parents would argue until about 30. <laughs> and it wasn't always the consequences that came with the action. Now, it should have been, granted. But there was an appropriate punishment for what the gentleman did. And it wasn't putting a scarlet letter on his forehead for the next five years so that he couldn't have a job, so that he couldn't be a productive taxpaying citizen. Why aren't we looking at things like that? Right now, we use the hammer with everybody over and over and over. And there are some people, by the way, that need the hammer. You're never going to save them. They need to be warehoused. There are other people through alternative sentencing, through community sentencing, through classes, through rehab, through counseling, avenues that we don't explore. Not much, anyway. Now, before somebody says, we don't have the resources, you're right. The state of Oklahoma has made a conscious decision over the last few years, last decade, really, that we're not going to fund things like that. And as I've told people before, if you're waiting for leadership at 23rd and Lincoln, we're all going to be dead. That is not necessarily the place where all the great ideas come from. And it is certainly not the place where you will find political backbone to do something. But if any of you can sit out there and tell me that the way that we're doing it right now is the best we can do, then I'll go back home. But I fundamentally don't believe that at all. In 20, let's see, action would be 14, I have a really good relationship with the George Kaiser Family Foundation. George Kaiser is a, a banker, billionaire, oil guy who really has a heart for women, especially. He has a heart for Tulsa, but really a heart for women and, and changing women's lives and thus changing the family dynamic and breaking the cycle of poverty. Because all of their research says that if you can keep a woman in the home, she's a lot more valuable than the man and you're twice as likely to break the cycle of poverty, non-education and criminal activity. So they've been focused on that and they have a program over there called Women in Recovery. And they've been very successful. It's a partnership funded in part through the state of Oklahoma and in part through the, the Kaiser Family Foundation. Part of the charge of the Kaiser Family Foundation is they have to leave the jurisdiction of Tulsa once George dies. And so they're looking for other opportunities. They can continue to participate, participate in Tulsa, but they also have to expand their footprint. Well, in 14 or 15, I thought, well, I've got a woman DA. We have a large incarcerated female population, and I've got a billionaire philanthropist with a heart for women that needs to expand his philanthropic uh, outreach. Let's get them together. And so I did. I set up a, a, a meeting. Um, yeah. The incumbent was there and gracious, and also went over to Tulsa and toured the facility. And then I kept following up with the right hand of, of George because that's my contact. And that's who I work with on a day basis. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Well, it went dark for you. We don't know what to do. I can't force it on anybody. We aren't even looking for the alternatives. We're not exploring the opportunities that we have before us. If I'm elected, I want to expand women in recovery to Stillwater. If I'm elected, I want to hire a grant writer. I want the grant writer to be in Trump's DOJ. And now Trump has not ever been accused of being soft on crime. I don't think there's anybody in here that thinks that's a thing. But in Trump's DOJ, there are plenty of multi-million dollar grants out there for diversionary programs. Punish somebody, but keep them out of incarceration. And you think, why? Why would, why would it be that way? President Trump doesn't like paying taxes either. It's the same reason the Koch brothers and Alec are funding the Right on Crime initiative. Because if you have less felons, you have less people in prison. And if you have less people in prison, you can pay lower taxes. And never was that more true than in the state of Oklahoma, where out of a $7 billion appropriated budget, my DOC director asked for $1.2 billion. $800 million of that is to pay for two new prisons. We're on a trajectory to have 5,000 new inmates in the next 10 years. And the only reason that's not 10,000 new inmates 
in the next 10 years is because we've helped, we passed some watered down criminal justice reform this year. And just so you know that criminal justice reform is not a partisan issue, you have Alec over here on the far right. I'll get my hands right. You have the ACLU over here on the far left. And they're both pulling in the same direction. And then you have brain trust like the Pew Charitable Trust and George Kaiser Family Foundation and others giving them all the empirical data to show, hey, by the way, if you pass criminal justice reform, not only will you save money, which, so it's a fiscally conservative argument, but you'll actually have enhanced public safety numbers because you're not tearing apart the moral fabric of your community. And for whatever reason in Oklahoma, we think we're reinventing the wheel. The really exceedingly liberal states of Texas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Idaho have all adopted criminal justice reform. Two things. The liberal part was a joke. And then the other thing is the public safety numbers are better. A lot better. In Texas, they have eight prisons that are empty. They don't know what to do with. I could be so lucky in Oklahoma. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have? What to do with my empty prisons? And for the fiscal conservatives among you, they took $250 million that they would have otherwise spent on the incarcerated population and they rerouted it into education. Didn't have to raise taxes. There's been this ongoing debate in Oklahoma about raising taxes and how we're going to fund things and whose back we're going to do it on. We don't even have to have that conversation. Let's just make smart choices. Let's talk about bond reform. We use bond as a secondary form of punishment. You got a first time offense and I'm going to give you a $7,500 bond? You can't afford to get out of jail? Oh, I'm sorry about you. We'll give you a public defender who already has a really heavy caseload. The odds of you entering into a plea deal in a situation like that are much greater. And you might think of why? Because you want to get out of jail. So you may plead guilty to something you didn't do. You may plead guilty to something that is even more enhanced than the thing you did, but you're looking at the plea deal going, I just want out of this place. I can't afford the bail. I can't afford an attorney. I've got these five charges pending. Now, before everybody thinks that I am just 100% pro-criminal defendant, I'm not. I believe in redemption. I believe in second chances. I also believe very much in punishing the bad guy and working on behalf of the victims. We've done that a lot down at the legislature. I had an inmate transfer yesterday. Look at somebody that I ran into at the county fair who said, this person who committed this crime against a minor child has now been placed within 15 miles of that child, and she can't sleep. What can you do? Call the director of DOC. Let's get a move. No way that he should have more rights than she does. She needs to be able to sleep at night. It's been bad enough. No reason to be traumatized every single night of the rest of your life. Victims should be protected as well. Now, I'm sure that you'll read soon that I voted against Marcy's Law. You'll get an opportunity to uh, vote on that in, in the coming days. And I feel like I always have to explain myself uh, because that's part of why I'm here. I believe very much in transparency. You may not like my answer, but you at least deserve to have that answer. I'm not a big fan of putting anything in the Oklahoma Constitution, and if you've ever tried to read it, you'll know exactly why. It's exceedingly long. It's a three-day project. Go pull down the Oklahoma Constitution and try and read it. We already have a Victim's Bill of Rights in the state of Oklahoma. It's contained in statute. What we don't have is prosecutors willing to follow it. Putting it in the Constitution doesn't change that. It just makes our Constitution longer. Now, on its face, is it a bad law? I don't believe so. I think it's fine. I just traditionally try to keep anything out of the Constitution that I possibly can. The voters happen to agree with me, by the way, because you guys all pulled alcohol out of the Constitution. Because any time that you want to change it, you had to send it to a vote of the people, and it became the most cumbersome document that you've ever seen. So. Um, Let's see, what else? Specific reforms. I want to do bond reform. I want to do alternative sentencing. Can I go back in and let somebody out of jail? No. I don't have that ability as DA. All I can do is what's going forward. Um, I don't 
you know, we're, we're not going to, uh, I've heard this, this rumor that I'm going to go and unlock the jailhouse and let everybody out. That's not true. I've also heard the rumor that I'm going to fire everybody currently uh, in the DA's office. Uh, even though I have a magnetic personality, I do understand that it's hard to get people to work with me. So uh, if they're already there, I think we'll just leave them in place. It's not really a, a problem with the personnel. It's a problem with the direction and the leadership and the policies that are currently in place. You don't have to go in and fell swoop, change everything out and change everyone out. I actually believe that being, especially an assistant DA, being a prosecutor is a calling. There's, people make a lot more money out in private practice. It's easier to feed your kids and everything else. So if they're there and they truly have a passion for the community and they want to work with me, people get to stay. That's not a real thing. Anyway, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, I appreciate everyone being here this evening. I know it's getting a little bit warm. Maybe it's just me.